Well, good morning, everybody. It's Andrew Cole again with the East Orlando Chamber of Commerce, and we have a very unique, and, and I'm very interested in hearing this, and it's a Victory Gardens for Americans Pandemic Gardens and Creating Your Own with Tia Silvesi from University of Florida. Uh, and uh, she's going to be explaining what we can do here to do some gardens and uh, pieces at home for that. But before we go any further, I do want to do a couple pleasantries quickly here with um, uh, to our sponsors. We are powered by PowerNet, who is enabling us to connect. Uh, they are power all of our webinars, and we are very appreciative of them. But they also do IT and phone services, not just a webinar platform, but they have this as an option too for you and your meetings if you need it for your company and or for pieces that you have there. Also want to recognize our trustees. We have Advent Health, Avalon Park Group, Avalon Insurance Services, Duke Energy, Fairwinds Credit Union, Great Florida Insurance of Hunters Creek, the Orlando Law Group, Orlando Health, and the Suburban Land Reserve. These are our stakeholders within our community and also with our uh, within the chamber. Uh, they are our top tiered members and we want to make sure we give them due recognition for what they do with the chamber and the assistance that they provide with us. So thank you very much to all of our trustees. Also, while we've got you here, we've got a peer to peer virtual refer, uh, referral forum for our uh, healthcare providers and uh, local practitioners that will be on August 6th from 8 to 9 a.m. Uh, this is really a peer-to-peer -peer gaining referrals from each other, working on building a network of physicians and referral um, uh, managers for these accounts for folks to be able to help build their network of referrals. And also, Wednesday, August 19th, that is going to be our monthly luncheon, but this is virtual. It is free for members, and we have Dr. Cartwright um, from UCF, so we'd love to have you there, hear from him and what is going on at UCF. They are a huge economic driver for uh, uh, East Orlando, where we're situated, so we want to make sure we're getting a chance to hear from him and what his visions are for his tenure as the new president of UCF. Also moving forward, Coffee Club is back. We're starting with a virtual Coffee Club, Nona, on August 20th. We set up a whole great way that we're able to do some wonderful networking and connection building uh, that we're going to do with a, a format that's very familiar for everybody there. So come join us for Coffee Club on August 20th, and that's sponsored by Duke Energy. We do appreciate that and moving forward. And I think the last one is our um, social media is too social. Uh, this is our optic. Uh, there is a lot of potential security breaches that are happening now through social media and how that impacts your, your business. This will be optic there. So just to let you know, that's coming up on the 21st of August. But without further ado, I want to introduce Tia here and uh, give the reins over to her so she can uh, she can take over the, the the piece here and put her presentation up. And Tia, welcome uh, to the East Orlando Chamber and a number of our members that have jumped on today. So we'd love to have you here. Great, and thank you for having me on today. Um, I live in East Orlando myself, out off by Tanner Road, and I'm happy to be here sharing about our Victory Garden program and give you some tips on creating your own garden and also offer some of my personal insights about what's been going on in the pandemic. I have a lot of friends, just personal friends, who are in the plant businesses and they were sold out of seed, selling all their plant materials. And people were really looking for uh, new ways to do business. And now, you know, people who have lost their job are thinking about making uh, income from growing vegetables or um, growing their own seeds or starting their own plant nursery, which is all you know, relatively easy things to do here in uh, Central Florida. Um, there used to be a business called the Homegrown Food Cooperative downtown Orlando, but they are no longer in business. And um, before I got a job as an extension agent, I was actually selling my kale to the co-op downtown. And uh, that's something we're really lacking in our community is like a central hub. The way it worked is 
I would grow whatever I had, you know, in my garden or my plant nursery. And then I would post it like online with a picture and a price. And then once a week they would, you know, take all the orders and then I would deliver the ordered products downtown to their office. And that worked really well for me as a, um, you know, home gardener, small business person at that time, because when you go to do a farmer's market, you know, you have to pick all of your stuff. You have to take it down there. Then if it rains or you have to set up a table and sit there for four hours. And of course, all your produce is like wilting. Um, so, you know, some more stuff like that is needed. And that's not exactly my job with the food systems, but um, my job is a Florida friendly landscaping agent. So I teach people how to have more environmentally sustainable landscapes and edible landscapes fit into that as well because we teach people how they can grow a vegetable garden or fruit trees and then fertilize and water properly so we're not wasting water or allowing nutrients to leach into our waterways. So today I'm going to be talking about our Victory Garden program and um, Victory Garden is actually trademarked so we named ours the Victory 2020 Garden Program. And this is a collaboration with many extension agents like myself. So I'm in Orange County and I'm working with people in Marion County, up in Gainesville and Columbia County and just all over the state. And what happened during the pandemic is when everybody, you know, went home from their jobs, it was the perfect time in the spring, like March 15th, to start a vegetable garden. And we were just coming out of winter and then daylight si savings time started at, uh, you know, March 6th or whatever. And then we all got sent home, say March 15th. And so now people had to stay at home and they, it was the perfect time of the year for starting a garden and they were worried about their food security. I mean, if you were in stores at the time, there were certain things that you could not buy, like toilet paper, um, the rice, the dried beans, those were all away from the shelves. And so people wanted to have a sense of security, and that's why they started their Victory Garden. And then additionally, people just wanted to have something to do, something fun, something safe and not only from gardening you get to grow your own food which you get to eat but you get to spend time outdoors you get to enjoy the fresh air um, and then through our online groups they got to network and socialize with other people who are doing gardening you know for the first time or who are seasoned gardeners and so I'll be telling you about the program today and um, I have a long history in agriculture. I grew up on a family farm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and so all of my jobs have been in plant nurseries, farms and arboretums, things like that. So I've been with the University of Florida now for about three years in research and extension and so I, I head up the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program along with working with community gardens or um, residential you know, homeowners or renters who want to grow vegetables or um, change their landscaping. So um, my email there is on the slide. If you want to write that down, tsilvesi at ufl.edu. And I also wrote it in the chat box for you all. So let's get started here. This is an article that came out. So the extension response to the coronavirus was like people are just grappling to learn about growing food. You know, people pulled out the seeds they had in their closets and were saving their seeds from the fruits and vegetables they were eating from the store, and they wanted to know how to grow their own food. So we launched the Victory Gardens program and provided that information as a response to that need. So here's uh, the website if you would like to join our Victory Garden program. And so I said it started in March and it is free and open to the public, uh, anybody in the state of Florida or internationally, we don't discriminate. 
Um, we still continue enrollment now, even though we have over 2,000 people in the program currently. And so, um, you know, the Victory Garden is reminiscent of the wartime gardens back in World War II. And we're currently not at war, but what we call we're in a war with an invisible enemy and which has caused a disruption to our daily lives. And so this Victory Garden, it's to grow your own food, but it's also to give people hope and peace and calm their minds and just give them something healthy to engage with because plants help to make the world a better place. So we were featured in several local news articles, um, the Victory Gardens, and it was a movement not only that the UF IFAS, you know, hopped on to, but there's other Victory Garden Facebook groups and initiatives uh, across the world right now as well. Here's another article about our Victory Gardens. So the extension agents, our job is to offer advice and provide resources like science-based resources from the University of Florida and also help diagnose, you know, pests, a disease problem, nutrient, what's wrong with my plant and offer general advice like what should I be planting now? So here are the online learning modules for our Victory Garden program. So we have many components. Um, one is they can sign up for free for these online learning modules if they have a computer. And it's uh, eight modules, which is self-paced, and it is free. And so you just sign up and then you can go through and learn how to start a garden, you know, basics about fertilizer, pesticides, soil building, um, how to harvest your um, garden, and then also preserving with the food and consumer science agents. They teach you how to correctly harvest and heat it up and, you know, make jelly and jam. And then we also have a kids component through the 4-H program where they have kids activities and games like uh, edible plant bingo and how to make a butterfly house, things to keep the kids engaged. Um, we have a Zoom webinar a component of our Victory Garden where we've taught about 22 Zoom webinars so far. And they're just the same topics, you know, how to design a vegetable garden, how to do it organically, what to do about weeds and diseases, saving your seed for next season. And all of these webinars are recorded and available at the link at the bottom on the YouTube page. And so people can go back and refer to them and there'll be a permanent resource that's available for free, no matter if you're starting a garden now or in the fall. So that's, that's a big accomplishment that we did. Um, we have a private Facebook group. So the people who registered with the University of Florida to enroll in the program for free, they were also invited to this Facebook group um, where we can share with them and they can share with us. It's a great forum for getting pictures of what people are growing or what kind of pest or disease problems they're having. And so we use this because it's one of the fastest ways to get information out to a lot of people. Um, we have about uh, 1,400 people on our Facebook group page right now. And we also use the Facebook page to cultivate community. So this is an example on the left of one of the posts that somebody put up. So they just have these three little pots of plants and they're you know making a new garden you can see the area behind the hose where they dug up a little area that's you know two feet wide by four feet long and they're like oh what should i grow you know should i do tomatoes peppers sweet potatoes maybe some garlic should i get my soil tested um so people are really just starting with what they have. And I mean, to me, this is a very small garden. Uh, some of the people in the Victory Garden program have a large garden, even up to like a quarter acre garden. 
but um, everyone is just starting at where they are. And so let me share some more successes and failures with you. So these are Everglades tomato pictured here, and they're tiny little tomatoes about the size of a dime. And so this is their first tomato, and they posted a picture of this, and they were so proud that they were able to grow the tomato plant and have it fruit. So um, some people, they post pictures of very large harvest, you know, a basket full of tomatoes, but even the small successes like this are very touching. And then we also have people record the harvest, such as a number of fruits or the weight of the fruit. And that way we can track our progress. That's what our bosses like to see is the economic impact. So if we have 2000 participants and everybody harvests uh, one pound of tomatoes, you know, a pound of tomatoes costs $4. So we can do the math and see you know, the economic impact of this program. So Tia, with, with, with the pieces here, does the University of Florida or on your groups there, do you provide uh, timelines when you should best plant things? You know, like it's too wet during the summer, or too hot. Do, do you help, help guide people? Because Florida is opposite of everybody else in the country, it seems, you know, when they're, yeah. they're harvesting, we're getting ready to plant type thing. Right, that's correct. And we do provide guidance on planting. So a big planting date here for Central Florida is going to be September 15th. And so we're kind of ramping up, you know, towards the end of summer to tell people, all right, buy your seeds now. The first thing to plant is corn, beans, squash, you know, broccoli and your cool season stuff plant like September 15th, get your seeds, get your pots, get ready to go. And is that found on the website? Because I had a question. Somebody said, is it the Victory Gardens Revival? Is that the Facebook page? They were asking that and had um, some questions on soil testing. Yeah, the, the name for the Facebook page is Victory Gardeners, but it is a private page. So if you want to um, enroll in the program, then you can go to the website I had uh, right here and then you will get uh, invited to the private Facebook page, but it's so not open for the public. So HTTPS, I'm gonna put that in the chat box so they can, uh, one minute. Mm -hmm. All right, I think I got it there. Oh, why didn't that go? VG 2020G. Yep, Victory 2020 Garden. All right, I can get that in there. All right, no, and then somebody else said they, if they need to get their soil tested, what, what do they go, where, what's the piece that they should go for doing that? Well, um, soil testing is not done in our local extension offices anymore due to COVID, but we recommend that you send it to the University of Florida soil testing lab up in Gainesville. And so what you will want to do is like take a small trowel and go around your yard or your vegetable garden, whatever soil area you want to sample and take about um, 10 samples and kind of get like a profile of the soil about three inches down. Don't just scrape it from the surface and then mix all that together. And then you want to send up to Gainesville about one cup of soil in a little bag. And then you have to pay for the shipping to Gainesville and you can go to the um, UF IFIS soil testing lab and you can download a form from that website that will give you the instructions and you can print that up and send it in with your soil. And it's a, I think it's a $12 fee for a basic analysis. So the soil testing is something that we recommend for people to do. However, I find that often it's not very practical, um, you know, for people to get all the materials and pay the shipping costs and get it up there. So I tell people if you don't have a soil test, that's fine. But if you notice some major problems in your um, garden or landscape, then it's a good time to have a soil test. What about raised gardens? Somebody said here, I have a tomato plant that had a flower, it lost it several times without bearing fruit. 
Is it because of the soggy environment, wrong time of year? Uh, is it particularly covered due to the extreme heat? She's frustrated. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, we have a lot of tomato frustrations, but raised garden beds are generally good. But in the summer, when the, the nights get really warm, like above 70 degrees, then it causes a problem with the tomato pollen in the humidity. It makes like the pollen stick together. And so the tomato flowers are not properly getting pollinated. And it, so they're not getting uh, fruit set at that time. So cherry tomatoes do well in the summer. For some reason, their pollen doesn't get as affected. Um, but the larger tomatoes, we usually save those for the cooler season. And so you can plant the tomato seeds right now so they're ready to go in the ground about September 15th. I, on a tomato plant, uh, somebody had told me you can cut a tomato in half and stick it in a, in a pot and it'll start to grow. Is that true? Um, yeah, the seeds can grow. There's a more technical way to save the seeds. You're supposed to squeeze them in a little like jar and then let them ferment a couple days because they have a like kind of gel seed coating and that will get rid of that seed coating and make them able to plant. But tomato seeds are pretty easy. They'll, they'll grow out of your compost pile or if you just stick them in a pot, they're, they're kind of hard to grow. Any All other right. questions? Uh, I think we'll have some more pop up here, I'm sure, um, right. on those there. So go ahead. I, I just saw people coming in. I thought we ought to get those answered while they were hot there. Thank you. All right. Well, we were talking about the failures. So there's uh, things that are really hard to grow in Florida. Some things grow easily. Like today, I just harvested a bunch of bananas. Um, but like watermelon, squashes, cucumbers are hard to grow because we have a lot of pest pressure like caterpillars and also disease pressure like downy mildew that will just wipe the plant out in a couple days. So this is an example of one of our Facebook posts that, oh, our pumpkins, our squash, our zucchini, our watermelons, they were all eaten by bugs. And this person was right near Orlando. And they says jalapeno peppers are the only thing we can get to grow. So <laughs> that's true. Like in the summer right now, no way on squashes, pumpkins, you know, unless you're growing the seminal pumpkin. But the hot peppers, then the cherry tomatoes and like okra, black eyed peas and sweet potatoes. Those are the types of crops that you can grow, you know, in these hot summer months and also animal damage. Like people will say, oh, I had two beautiful tomatoes yesterday and today they just disappeared or all the leaves got eaten. And so maybe it was a deer or a squirrel or a raccoon or even their pet dog or something. Um, there's just all kinds of things that can happen to your vegetables. So, so we did have a comment came in. It said, uh, you shouldn't grow zucchini, butternut squash, or cucumbers till September 15th. She hasn't Correct. growing it back in the pots, but uh, they have bugs and uh, little kind of black dots. They flower, but then drop off. You know what that might be? Um, during the hot summer months, I mean, it could be bacterial leaf spot. They could have aphids. They're probably going to get the fungus, downy mildew fungus pretty soon. So it's, it's, uh, you can take a chance and plant stuff now, but you're likely going to run into a lot of problems. So it's not impossible, but it's just challenging. And, and then the follow up with that was, is there a safe way, and maybe you'll hit this, but a safe way to get rid of bugs in pieces without using pesticides, any recommendations? And if you have that coming up, let us, we can wait till then. Yeah, and we do recommend organic and natural pest control options in IPM, but um, it depends what pest specifically you have that we recommend the treatment for that. For example, caterpillars, are easily killed with a natural bacteria called BT, which is BT is short for Bacillus thuringiensis. Then it only targets caterpillars because we want to avoid killing like all the good insects with the bad. And that's another strategy too, is to attract the beneficial insects to your garden, like the ladybugs that will eat the aphids and then you won't have to spray. So what, I'll get um, to that later. 
That'd be good. Okay. And yeah, she, she had asked here, then what about the downy mildew? <laughs> uh -huh. the, the fungicides are tougher. You can use a preventative spray of neem, neem yeah. oil, which is organic. Um, but some of, some of the funguses are, there's not too much you can do unless you have like a commercial farm and use really toxic products. Mm. Yep, so another component of our um, Victory Gardens is the book club. And so this is another way for people to connect with people. Whereas the Zoom webinars, it's mostly, you know, me or one of the agents, you know, getting out information, real scientific information in a PowerPoint format. The book club provides opportunities for the participants just to come online in a Zoom meeting and have a discussion and discuss topics. So pictured here on the left is Wendy Wilbur and she's our statewide master gardener coordinator. And so the book club was started under the master gardener program and our victory garden program kind of collaborated with those. And here she's, you know, talking about the book pollinator friendly garden. We also read a book, Foodscape Revolution, and we're getting ready now to start the book, How to Grow More Vegetables, for all of our vegetable gardeners to get into the fall uh, vegetable season. So um, we've had some success with this. Sometimes we have a lot of people participate and sometimes we have to carry the conversation, you know, a little bit more, but I'm hoping with the new vegetable book, we'll get more interest. And then I wanted to share some results of our Victory Garden. Um, and this was as of, as of last month, the end of June, we had 2,283 participants. And like I said, the program is still open. You can register today. And so that number is building. Um, we currently, we had last month um, 40 different states. So 40 out of 50 states, and then also two territories like uh, Puerto Rico. And then also five countries, so including the U.S., but we also have a gardener in Germany, and we have one in Japan, and so they post funny-looking bugs that we don't know what it is, and they ask us for help, too. Um, so a little bit more about the participants. So on the Facebook page, um, we have about 1,400 right now. And then um, we provided about 20 Zoom workshops to this state with over 400 participants. And then we have Zoom workshops scheduled um, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. So I believe next week's topic is going to be hydroponic gardening. Then we're going to have a speaker on microgreens. And later this month, or I mean, end of August, I will be doing a talk on worm composting. And then Canvas, that's our online uh, learning modules that I shared with you. And we have about 1,900 people logged onto the Canvas. And they can go to the modules and read them over as many times as they want. We record special videos for our students for the online modules. And then part of the program at the beginning, we're currently out of seeds, but the, the first uh, 1,600 people who joined the program, they were sent by mail three types of seeds, um, which included cucumber, corn, squash, or cowpeas. And a total number of seed packets mailed were about 5,000. And so even though it wasn't uh, too much, that people were just excited about getting something in the mail, especially since a lot of the seed companies were sold out of seed for a period of time there. Um, the seed companies are now restocking and they say they shall have you know, supply available this fall. And so I'll take this uh, moment to take any more questions and then I'll get into um, some tips on how to start a garden. So there was another one that had uh, jumped in here. You talked about like uh, good insects. What, what can you do to attract good insects? And if you have any of this coming up, just uh, we can segue to that. But to like attracting uh, ladybugs and then are ants beneficial um, to a garden? 
Okay, so uh, to attract good insects, you want to plant um, plants that provide food for them and also have like water or shelter. And I will be talking about that um, more here on the 10 tips. And ants are, they're, they're kind of neutral. They're not really good. They're not really bad. But you'll often see ants when you have like aphids as a pest because the aphids secrete like a sugary substance that the ants like to go and eat that. So it's a good determinator that you might have an issue. Yeah, check uh, for other things. Those. And then uh, Connie had asked, she goes, uh, the, plant, the veggies that she planted too early, uh, will, they sur will they survive? This is one about the, the squash that she had or the zucchini. Or is, she, is she better just to pull them out and plant them in the fall or should she uh, and start all over or should she try to keep them going? Um, I would keep them going just for fun, but also, um, you know, just plan that they're not really going to produce anything. Like, don't like have that. high expectations and then so, plan to start them again in the fall. It, you, you talked a little bit about, like, like, I think zucchini, cucumbers and that, but don't they grow quite a few cucumbers, like, especially up in Zellwood, like at Scott's farm and things like that? Like, yes. is that yeah, because they can treat them? Um, yeah. What was the last part? Is it because they can treat them or have the, the commercial side to be able to make them go? Because you said that this isn't the best time. I don't know when they grow them. Maybe it's the wrong, I'm thinking the wrong season, but mm -hmm. they do grow them. Yeah, the prime cucumber time here in Florida is like September and then again in February. Okay. And so yeah. we have two seasons, one in the fall and one in the spring. And um, if you are growing cucumbers, we get a lot of caterpillar problems on them. And so you do need to watch out for the caterpillars. And then you can also select varieties that are, you know, more resistant to the pests and disease of this area. Okay. But uh, Florida is known as a cucumber region. Mm -hmm. And squash grows also down in South Florida, doesn't it? They do a lot of the yellow squash and the mm -hmm. pieces there. Yeah, the yellow squash and the zucchini. Yep. And then a lot of watermelons up in uh, kind of central North Florida. Yes. Yeah, so we really are a big agricultural state. Any other questions? Well, let's continue on and see what else pops up. Okay, sure. So um, this picture on the right is one of my flats of starter vegetables. So. I get them started in a little pot, like a four cell pot, or this is a four inch pot pictured here. And then I cut little um, from the yogurt containers. I'll use the scissors and cut and make these little labels. And then I can label okra, jalapeno. So this is from a couple months ago. This was my summer garden when I was getting it going. And so that's what you're, um, you should be starting to do now, you know, and prepare for the fall to get your little um, pots and your seeds. So right now I tell people to go, go buy your seeds for your fall garden. But the first thing you want to do is you want to do research on what to plant when. And the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide is a great publication produced by the University of Florida. And if you just Google UF IFAS a Vegetable Gardening Guide, you can download this for free. It's a PDF and a web page. And it has a table in the back of the guide that shows you what vegetable to plant in what month for Central, South, or North Florida. And then additionally, um, the little chart on the left, the edibles to plant in April, our um, Master Gardener Volunteer Program puts this out once a month. So if you follow our Facebook pages or um, the Florida Master Gardener Facebook page, then you can find these and they can help guide you of what to be planting. So we have a lot of resources and that's also my job as an extension agent is to connect you know, the public with all these science-based resources to help them grow you know, vegetables or whatever it is they want more efficiently. So number two is to select and grow varieties suitable for Florida. 
So the seminal pumpkin, which is pictured on the left, um, this was grown by the Native Americans. You can read historical accounts about it growing along the St. John's River. And this is especially resistant to caterpillars. And so I have some seminal pumpkin growing in my garden right now. And it does really well when all the other pumpkins will fail. So I showed you also the picture of the Everglades tomato that was that tiny little tomato. So it's a cherry tomato and it will bloom and produce all summer long when other, you know, crops is too hot to grow. And this also the rattlesnake pole bean, you know, that can take the summer heat. And so look for varieties in the, um, UF publications, we list some variety names next to the, you know, beans or tomato. Look for those varieties. I also find the Japanese eggplant, which is like the long skinny ones. Those, those do really well here in Florida. Is the seminal pumpkin an edible pumpkin or is it a more decorative kind of fall pumpkin that a lot of people use? Um, that is an edible pumpkin. So it has an orange creamy flesh. You just bake it in the oven, you know, cut it in half, bake it for a half an hour or so. It's delicious. As a squash type, as a, as a dish, or can you actually cook it, put it in pumpkin pie? <laughs> yeah, you could make pumpkin pie out of it. Mm -hmm. I like to just slice mine and add a little olive oil, salt and pepper, and roast it like 10 minutes on each side for the slices. Nice. So tip number three is to add lots of compost to the soil. Um, here in Florida, most of our soil is extremely sandy and it lacks nutrients. So compost just has many, many benefits. I wrote just a couple of them here. One, it increases the organic matter and organic matter is good because it provides food for beneficial microbes which are the bacteria and the fungi and they're what um, break down the organic matter and turn it into nitrogen and help to make the other nutrients available to the plant roots. Um, it also increases water holding capacity. So you don't have to water as often. It helps the water bind to the soil. And it releases nutrients slowly. This is all broken down organic matter. It has nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and those nutrients are slowly releasing into the soil. Do you um, need a compost bin or something when you're doing it? And do you have tips on how to, how to what you should put into a compost pile and when, to, when it's ready to be dispersed into your garden? Yeah, we, we teach a whole webinar on that, and it is a webinar that I've taught, and it's on our Victory Gardens um, YouTube page, mm -hmm. but you do want to put specific materials in there. We tell people to avoid, you know, meat and sometimes like bones or stuff like that, and not that it doesn't decompose, but just that, you know, it might attract dogs or vermin. And then there's a slight risk of pathogen contamination, you know, if you don't compost it hot enough or for a long enough time. And then if you Google um, the UF um, IFIS composting, we have a composting tips for a home gardener type of publication that has all the basic information in it as well. And you can use a pile, like I, at my house, I just have a compost pile, or you can buy a bin like a plastic bin to put it in. Um, if you live in the city of Orlando or the city of Winter Park, both of those cities have incentive programs um, where they give you a free composter if you take the class that we teach. And if you don't make your own, then you can buy bags of compost to look for something just labeled organic compost, like the black cow, um, like horse manure is good or just something that says garden soil is also good. But you do not want to put like potting soil in your garden or you can, but it's just a waste of money. And composting is so important. It, everybody should be doing it. So here's the next step. Number four is take time to prepare your bed. 
So these are some garden beds at a community garden um, in Altamont Springs, uh, St. Mary Magdalene. And they added compost to the top of the beds. And then you just want to, you know, mix the compost in with the existing soil, maybe using a pitchfork or a shovel. You know, at each season, top off the bed so your soil level isn't going down, down, down. You want to keep adding new soil. And then break up any clumps in the soil, smooth it out, you know, remove any kind of large roots if they're growing in there. We don't have to worry about rocks that much, but in Pennsylvania, we had to remove large rocks from the garden as well. And then plant carefully. So we want to choose quality plants. Um, you can grow them from seed or you can buy transplants from your local plant nursery or hardware store and that's just fine. So when planting, you loosen the roots, make sure it's not root bound, maybe give them a little massage. Um, add soil amendments if needed. Some plants like tomatoes are heavy feeders and they need a lot of uh, nitrogen and nutrients to produce. Um, and then we recommend mulching everything if, just with a light layer of um, leaves or even um, hardwood kind of mulch or like straw or use your old grass clippings. And then after planting, water them in thoroughly. Always water in after planting. That way they can rehydrate and it also helps the soil particles settle in so there's not any air pockets that could negatively affect the roots. And then check them after planting. Always go the next day and check your plant. Sometimes in my yard, I'll plant a flower and then like an armadillo or something will come overnight and dig it up. And then I have to replant it the next day, maybe step on it a couple times or put a rock or something around it so it will stay in. And then tip number six is to nurture your garden. So you want to observe your garden on a daily basis or at least a couple times a week and check them for water. And the water check like first thing in the morning or in the evening because it's natural for plants to wilt during the middle of the day. Um, they also might need some support like a trellis or a little bamboo stake or something. And then you can also be growing your own bamboo to produce your own trellis materials. Um, depending on what crop you're growing, you might have to fertilize with some nutrients. And I'll talk about that in a minute along with pests and um, checking for disease. If you notice some spots or wilting, that might be a disease problem. So usually, the best thing to do is pick those leaves off, but you don't want to remove too much leaf material. And then you can always take a photo of your problem and send it to me at my email or to our IFAS extension office here in Orange County. And then reapplying the mulch as needed. So watering is important. So like I was saying, check plants in the morning or the evening, make sure they're nice and perky. If you have um, containerized plants, you'll have to water those more frequently. And we wanna water in the morning before 10 a.m. or after 4 p.m. in the evening. And that's because it's so hot in the middle of the day, we don't wanna waste water to the uh, transpiration going up in the air. We want the water to go into the soil and be absorbed by the plant roots. And so um, in, in East Orlando here, I'm in the St. John's Water Management District, which um, has regulations for water use for lawn and landscape areas for automated irrigation systems, but for your vegetable garden um, that is exempt from the water restrictions. However, we still want to water in an efficient way that we're not wasting water. And next we're going to talk about fertilizer. So um, this is the type of fertilizer pictured in the center that I buy. It's an organic garden tone. Um, you don't have to buy organic fertilizer. You can buy synthetic fertilizer 
Um, they work pretty much the same. The synthetic fertilizer will have some more salt potentially building up in your soil. But um, you can just sprinkle this around your plants. So here is a seminal pumpkin plant that I have a shovel full of fertilizer and I put it right around the plant and then I cover up the fertilizer with some soil. That way it's not just laying on the surface. Also the organic fertilizer can be a little stinky. So it might attract, you know, your dog or some animals to it. So that's another good reason to cover it up with soil and or mulch. And when you're growing vegetables or fruit trees, you want to use a fertilizer that contains micronutrients. So whereas your turf grass, it just pretty much needs a little bit of nitrogen and potassium. But the vegetables and fruit trees, they only need some micronutrients like calcium and magnesium and things like that that aren't commonly found in the cheap fertilizers. Um, so other best practices, don't apply before heavy rain. Um, use organic or slow release fertilizers. That way they don't get to our waterways really quick. They can be absorbed by the plants. And always read the label and follow instructions. For example, on this bag of fertilizer, it will say, you know, if you have a one gallon plant, use two tablespoons of fertilizer for it and it will kind of give you for 1,000 square feet use one pound of fertilizer. So you can follow those instructions on the bag and if you need any help interpreting that then that's what we are here for. And now on to our pests. So we recommend to use integrated pest management which is IPM for short. And the step one of the IPM program is to identify insects. So for example, a lot of people know the ladybug pictured on the right, but um, that's a beneficial insect that eats aphids. But a lot of people don't know about the lacewing larvae pictured on the bottom left. So that is a larvae of a beneficial lacewing, and you can see it has an aphid and it is eating the aphids off of the plant. So we want to attract um, good bugs like that, and we don't want to spray the good bugs either with the pesticides. So you can attract good bugs by planting flowers, um, like the purple cone flower pictured here with the butterfly, uh, zinnias, marigolds, um, you know, butterfly plants like milkweed, those are all good for attracting beneficial insects. And then spray only if needed. We have like a threshold. If the pest problem gets worse than this level, then we will spray. And then when we do spray, we recommend the organic or natural pest controls first. And there's another wonderful um, publication, University of Florida, that is natural pest control. So if you just Google natural pest control, um, UF, IFAS, then you should be able to find that. And again, follow the label instructions. And then tip number 10 is to close the loop. So um, just think about adopting some more sustainable practices. Um, on the right is a picture of a compost pile. So they got a couple pallets and they're recycling their leaves and their kitchen scraps and their garden wastes in that compost pile. And then the picture on the bottom is me where I have a seminal pumpkin and I'm teaching people how to save the seeds. Um, this video is on my Facebook page, which is Garden Florida Facebook. And, um, you know, we just make a lot of videos to show people little tips, um, what they can do. And people have really loved the videos and the little kind of like bite-sized tips that you can digest in a couple minutes. Okay, great. Now, now next time I get a pumpkin, I know how to save the seeds. So you can eat the seeds, you can replant the seeds, you can save them for next season. And it's a good activity for not only adults, but kids. My, my nieces and nephews, they come over and they like to help me save the seeds and stuff too. 
So that concludes my presentation. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any more questions about the Victory Garden program or just um, growing plants in general. So thank you for having me. So here's a, we've got a plethora that popped in. And so uh, yeah, we've got one, my kids gave me a rolling compost drum with two sides. I'm feeling it like a champ uh, using your, using your guide, but I don't know when to use, when or how to use it. Uh, when do, excuse me, when do I know I can add it to my soil? Is there like, what do I do now? You've got it stuffed there and when, when do they know it's ready to be used? Yeah, so the, I'm familiar with those rolling compost tumbler things and it's, they're a little bit difficult to use because it's mixing all of the compost together all of the time whereas if you just had a pile and you kept layering on top and on top then the stuff at the bottom would be finished so if you do have a compost tumbler you can consider you know doing it one batch at a time like filling it all the way up and then letting it decompose for a couple months and then harvesting it and then filling it again but if you are continually adding to the compost tumbler then all the old stuff will get mixed in with the new stuff. And so in that case, your best bet is to get a sifter, like a metal grate or something that you can separate the chunky stuff that's not decomposed and let the fine, you know, soily kind of compost stuff fall through so that you can harvest that and use it. But you know your compost is ready to harvest when it no longer looks like banana peels and apple cores and it just looks like black dirt, crumbly, and doesn't have a smell. Okay, that goes into a great next question. I have a small area to plant. Is there, are there small compost containers? Do they smell? I live in a townhome community is what the question was. So. Mm -hmm. um, you can compost on any scale. So even if you just say have a two foot by two foot area, you could build your own kind of compost pile and it should not smell. A uh, trick to getting it to not smell is anytime you add fresh food scraps, like say your banana peel, then cover that with some leaves or some soil or um, some type of brown material and that will absorb the smell. You never want to have fresh food like exposed to the air because then the bugs and vermin and stuff will smell that and be attracted to that. And it might take a little longer if you just have a little compost pile, but you still will be able to compost and I would recommend it. All right, plants and containers should not be watered in the middle of the day or should they be watered in the middle of the day? So uh, Good question here, like if you have a patio or, or like me, I have a, I live in a condo, what, what kind of gardening and what, what are some tips for somebody that wants to do a little bit on their patio? Yeah, so I mean, the rule of thumb is to water in the morning, in the evening, but if, if your plant is dying of thirst, then please give it a drink in the middle of the day. Um, I garden on my back porch, I have a deck, and I use a self-watering, um, grow box. So it's like has a lot of soil volume. It's made out of plastic. And then on the bottom, it has a water reservoir that holds a lot of water. So I don't need to actually water it that often. And if you don't have one of those grow boxes or earth boxes, and you just have a standard pot, then I would recommend to buy one of those little clay saucer things that go underneath it. And that way it will just hold a little bit extra water and won't um, you know, destroy the surface of your patio. But you can grow a lot of things on a patio. It's best to stick with smaller plants like herbs, herb gardens. You could grow a bush type of tomato or some cherry tomatoes or peppers or maybe one or two cucumber plants. But I wouldn't recommend uh, like trying to grow corn or watermelon yeah. or something really large up on there. And then again, integrate some, you know, basil or flowering plants to help attract the beneficial insects if it's not screened in as well. 
So a couple of questions back on that, and I've got, and this ties into the next one here. With that, um, uh, when growing, growing in small areas, do you want, like this is the one that's here, it's saying you should not, should you, are there certain things you should grow together within a raised garden or should you just put everything in? What are there, are there good tips of what grows well or uses water or the same type of fertilizers? Um, are flowers in the yard around the gar raised garden in the same, should they go in the same container? What, what, what are your recommendations for like raised gardens kind of thing with that there or planting specific species together? Yeah, um, that can get uh, kind of complicated because there's so many plants and so many combinations, but a lot of people might be familiar with the Three Sisters Garden, where you have like corn, beans, and squash. And so you plant the corn first and it will start to grow up and then you plant the beans and they will grow up the corn and the squash helps to cover the ground and shade the ground and retain the moisture. So you have to just kind of look at everything individually. Sometimes people tend to plant too many plants close together and then it has an overall negative effect because they're just too crowded and they're not getting the water or the nutrients or the space, maybe the sunlight that they need. So if you're a beginner, I would maybe start with like a square foot gardening method or somewhere where, you know, you just have like a row of green beans or like a little patch of one thing and then a little patch of another thing. And then you can really hone in how to grow all the crops individually. And then as you get more advanced, you could kind of mix them together and see how that was goes. But, um, it's not never a problem to mix in a couple flowers here and there, especially on the corners or the borders. That's a great place to mix in flowers and herbs. Um, here in City Beautiful, we're, we have a lot of trees and a lot of gardens, uh, especially vegetable garden, need, need the full sun. What do you recommend for folks that have a lot of shade? How do you, how do you work the garden with that? Yeah, the shade can be a problem for vegetable gardens because most vegetables need six to eight hours of sun. And if you have a big shade tree, you might not be getting that. So you can plant vegetables that are more shade tolerant. Um, these would include leafy green vegetables such as lettuce, kale, um, Swiss chard, uh, spinach, bok choy, and also like root crops such as carrots or radishes or turnips. The problem you're going to have is with the flowering plants um, like tomatoes or peppers or eggplant that really need that full sun. And if you can, you know, pick the sunniest spot in your yard to plant those. Um, that would be good. And just experiment and see what does well for you. I have a lot of shade trees in my yard and I'm having real good luck with the pumpkins and my bananas and papayas and stuff love it too. And they don't need the full, full sun. They can kind of survive in a heart shade situation. So here you said bananas. Somebody said, can I grow bananas and can you grow them from some, if you grow them from seed, do you grow them from the banana? You just need to go out and buy a banana tree. And then I know they grow from pups and stuff like that from the ground. What like once the, the tree bears fruit, but. Yeah. So you want to get a banana plant from a nursery. And I just was at Home Depot and I saw some there. They have the dwarf banana, which I don't find produces as well as just the standard. But here in Central Florida, the apple banana is mm -hmm. the kind of standard variety. It's like the short little bananas. And yeah, once you plant them, they will reproduce by the little pups <laughs> and send out little shoots. And then you can cut those off with a shovel and make new patches of bananas in other places of your yard. They do like it uh, wet. Like they like a lot of nutrients and they like wet soil. They're kind of like elephants of the plant world. So if you do have a moist area, you know, next to your compost pile or something that would be ideal. All right. And then uh, somebody also asked, uh, for, can you provide like the website information once again uh, and Facebook page uh, information? I know you got to get on that one. And then 
Another one came through. Are there any plants that need to have a sister plant in order for them to produce? Um, somebody's trying to grow an avocado tree. Okay, yeah, some plants, um, some varieties of avocado, they do need to be cross-pollinated, but it might depend on the exact variety that you have because some are self-pollinating and others need, uh, you know, like a male and a female plant, like blueberries are like that. They need to be cross-pollinated. And so... If you have your exact variety name, you could look up to see um, what type of pollination it requires and determine if it needs the two plants or not. Great. Any other questions? We've, we've kind of gone our hour. I want to make sure we're respectful of everybody's time, but if you've got a few more minutes there, Tia, we'll be glad to answer any more questions uh, yeah. on those. Yeah. And, and I'm um, putting the name of my um, Facebook page in the chat now. It's Garden Florida. Perfect. Okay. And they can reach you by uh, email too, that if they need to send you an email, you can send them the links to anything that, that's there with the webinars or the, the pieces or to sign up for the different courses that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if I know like some of us do live in the city of Orlando, but if you wanted to get a composter, you can just go to, you can connect us to what course you need to take so you can apply for those through Winter Park or city of Orlando. Yeah, and then the Orange County, um, Orange County Utilities, they have a free rain barrel program too, okay. where you can take their class and get a free rain barrel. Nice. A lot of very cool information here. I, I'm, I'm trying to see if I missed anything else because sometimes when people asked a few, uh, went back there. But yeah, I, I'm, I've always been worried about the shade. That's always been tough. You know, we've got lots of great trees here in Central Florida. And I've seen people growing gardens more and, you know, they have a, have a beautiful looking garden that they built. And I'm always worried whether or not they're going to get the yield of what they want. Are there any plants, and I'll, I'll ask this one, but any, any plants or, or vegetables, you know, like my brother grew a bean plant and, you know, he was proud. He had three pots of them with beans growing, but he had about enough for one serving of beans. Uh -huh. <laughs> and what recommendations, if you want to have enough yield to feed a family of four of something, do you have, do you have like ideas of yields of what a plant like beans or a squash, you know, so I don't end up with like, you know, 40 squash and I'm having to pass them out to my neighbors and they're going no more squash or no more pumpkins or something. Do you, do you have recommendations yeah. what, a, what the seeds yield on any of the websites? Um, I'm not sure specifically about that, but, um, you know, something like tomatoes, you might want to plant like two tomato plants per person. And it's part of like, what will the tomato plant produce? But it's also partly like, how many plants can you manage at your house? You know, mm -hmm. so kind of compromising between that. Um, for example, beans are one of the easiest vegetables to grow. You just plant the seeds in the soil. They don't have very many pest or disease problems. And then you'll get about a handful of beans from each plant. So if you plant, you know, say like 20 plants, 20 bean plants, that should be enough, you know, for maybe like a four person family to have two bean dinners, something like that. It's kind of okay. hard to say like with the squash and stuff. Some, sometimes you don't get any harvest off the squash. And then some people have like beginner's luck and get like a bunch of squashes. So I just try to grow a little bit of everything and whatever, uh, you know, hobo stir fry for dinner with a little bit of beans, a little bit of squash and whatever and grew in the garden. And let, does lettuce do pretty well here in Central Florida? Because, you know, like if you're making salads, you know, you can plant a couple heads of lettuce and, and you know, you've got kind of salad for at least a couple weeks, <laughs> depending on... Yeah, lettuce grows really well here in the winter, like starting in October. And one of the tricks to getting a continual harvest is to replant, you know, every other week. So just, just don't plant at one time because it lives for only 45 days, but plant it like, you know, October 1st, plant it October 15th, plant it November 1st, and keep it going. And that way you'll have a continual harvest of lettuce. Uh, 
That's a great tip. Um, do you know if Seminole County has a rain barrel program? Um, no, I, I'm not familiar if they have any programs up there, but you could call the Seminole County Extension Office and ask them. And another one was, or do you know of any courses or classes you can take on how to build one? <laughs> um, they just had a class yesterday on making a rain barrel on the um, UF Water Facebook page. So if you want to send me an email, I can send you that link. Sure. That was Dorothy. So I think you have ours there. So uh, okay. send one over to Dorothy if uh, uh, you've got hers and you can do that and probably send anything else. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, like I said, there's some really cool things. I mean, I could probably go on for another 40 minutes with questions. I, and I live in a condo, but I, I did a lot of groundskeeping. So uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear this. It's kind of fun and kind of like, I think it's something to, you know, great opp opportunity, especially with the fall coming, to do something activity out wise and, uh, you know, the raised gardens and, and pieces. Uh, are, do you recommend that over putting something in the ground? Is that just easier or easier to manage? I think it's like mentally easier because you have like, all right, this is my garden. It's a four by eight foot box and I'm really going to take care of it. You know, if, if you get more advanced, like a larger garden, you won't need to buy all that wood or, and you don't need to buy that anyway. You can use, uh, you know, tree logs or something for free, something you find for free or cement blocks or something. But it helps. I think it helps people delineate. All right, this is my garden and make it nice. Do you need to worry about using pressure treated wood if you're building a raised garden or using that in your garden with the chemicals that they treat that PT? The pressure treated wood isn't um, treated with like the really toxic, you know, like arsenic and stuff like it used to be. So it is safe, but some people are still concerned about the chemicals and will opt for like cedar type of wood, you know, that is not pressure treated, but more water resistant, but that's a lot more expensive. So there's well, also the um, yeah. recycled lumber wood that lasts a really long time but that's even more expensive, I think. Yeah. Or you can build it up with rocks if you need to do that yeah. around the, the side. <laughs> All right. Well, any other questions for anybody? If not, uh, Connie, you got one? Hold on. She's typing feverishly. Yeah. Actually, I can unmute you, Connie, if you want to just ask it. Is that easier? Okay. Um, so I have those big plastic PBA free containers is that's what I'm planting in uh -huh. and I have carrots in two should I have waited till September with those as well yeah carrots like the cooler weather but um you could let them grow now and see what happens they look like they're doing okay I can't they're in the there I put them in a shady spot so it's not so hot no oh, that's good yeah, okay. and then the, the other thing with carrots is you want to um, thin them. So if you put like too many seeds all together, they won't grow carrot roots. You want to thin them maybe to one inch apart at first and maybe to two inch or three inch later down the road. Okay. All right. That was it. Thank you. This is great. Yeah. Great. And feel free to email me with any questions and I can send you some links for webinars and upcoming classes that we're having. Wonderful. All right. Anybody else have anything else they want to add or share? Um, I, I'm kind of inspired. Now I'm kind of jealous. I don't have a, have a backyard anymore. <laughs> and you can join a community garden. There you go. And uh -huh. we see those popping up and uh, uh, throughout and uh, is there, let me ask this one, just with the, you know, you, you talked about doing the, the, uh, the plants that are plant friendly for like the, for ladybugs and the different pieces. Um, should those be planted relatively close to where your raised garden or your garden is or will they, will they eventually find it? And is there a way to, is it worth going and buying a hundred lady, ladybugs from online or something like that to get it jump started if you, to something like that? Is there any, or if I just plant it, they will eventually come? Yeah, if you plant it, they will come. It's not really worthwhile to buy the ladybugs. And 
If you have the beneficial plants within 500 feet of where you're trying to handle the pest control, then that's a good distance, 500 okay. feet or closer. All right, good to know there, because I, I know that's something to think about. I, Dorothy and I were talking about that yesterday, so. <laughs> uh huh. So very cool, and and butterfly. Do you have anything on butterfly gardens? Just I mean, I know that's not necessarily fruit and vegetable, but on the note of attracting good insects, and I know we need bees, and bees are looking for uh, places to pollinate, and needing you know we've got a potential crisis on our hand with bees from what I've heard, but uh, are there specific plants that we should be planting around our homes and things to help attract and keep the population of these good insects from being wiped out? Yeah, and we do a butterfly gardening class and specifically for butterflies, you want to plant the larval host plant. So whatever the butterfly caterpillar eats, if you plant that, that will provide you know, food and habitat for the butterfly. For example, the monarch butterfly is exclusive for uh, milkweed plants. So there's several species of native and non-native milkweed and they all provide the food and larval host place for the butterflies. Monarch are, there, butterflies. are there native butterflies that we should be more concerned about um, for here locally that, that are more Florida, Florida, <laughs> Florida uh, varieties of butterflies that we want to make sure are thriving here more than than the monarchs. I know they migrate. Mm -hmm. Um, like I don't know specifically about the butterfly species, but we do recommend. I know the zebra longwing that is our state butterfly, and that likes the passion flower vine. And then they, we also have the Julia butterfly and the queen butterfly. And so, you know, just a, planting a variety of plants and researching what their larval host plant is for providing for the butterflies is the best thing to do. And now I've opened up a whole nother can of worms here, but we'll, we'll do this quick and we'll let everybody go. But uh, does Rome, rosemary help keep bug, bugs away? And then uh, maybe you can help us out on this is, can we have a class on future with, for pollinators? So maybe we'll reach out and try to, if you can point us in a good direction of maybe doing the butterfly gardens, bees and things like that, we'll do another follow up. So maybe we can work with you there, but on the rosemary question there. Yeah, sure. For rosemary, um, that has essential oils. And so the strong smell of it does help to deter pests along with other herbs. So that is good for, keeping bugs away, but it's, it's not going to work like DEET or anything and kill all the mosquitoes. So, you know, just use it as a supplementary type of method. And use it for cooking. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Kitchen herb garden. Yeah, and well, I'm great. definitely open to um, teaching more classes and I can connect you guys with other people in the extension office for horticulture or other life skills. and. Um, connect you to our online resources. Wonderful. Well, we'll look to connect with you again. Thank you so much for being here, Tia, in your afternoon. I know we went a little long, but I think everybody here was kind of interested in what we've got going. And, you know, there's some neat things we can do here and to, to help the wildlife and also to sustain ourselves and or to, to keep our, our uh, environment healthy. So um, really appreciate your time today. Some great information and thank you. Great, thanks for having me. Well, wonderful. If you got any other questions for Tia, please email her, hers is in the chat and we'll have this posted for everybody. But thank you again and thank you for being here, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, bye-bye.